All right. So we're down to the second part of our series of lectures for thermodynamics. And I'm going to pick off where we left off last. I'm going to pick up at where we left off last time. In Ayrapan ako English. So we're going to talk about heat again. But this time we're going to uh, put details in so that you would understand how problem solving works in uh, thermodynamics in chem 16. So uh, remember how what we said last time about heat where this is again it operates with the same units as uh, energy that we talked last time which is in joules or calories. Uh, so uh, by the way uh, there's a conversion between the two uh, which is one calorie is 4.184 joules. You don't have to worry about it too much uh, if that conversion is needed it's gonna be explicitly stated in the exam okay so um, we also remember la last time that I said um, that there's a difference between um, heat Q and enthalpy in reality there's not much difference in actual thermodynamic literature the two are the same uh, we make a distinction in chem 16 only to make sure that uh, we understand um, the context of each of the problems that uh, we use for either case. Uh, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. So, but again, um, Q is how we write things in a general sense to mean this is heat in any way that we want it to uh, envision. Uh, delta H or enthalpy is different in that it um, it's mostly associated with um, changes like physical uh, changes and chemical changes or chemical reactions. Uh, okay, so um, next part is we define how we determine energy in cases where we have real examples of heat transfers. So um, before we begin, let me just pull up a new term. Or a new concept which is let me just dry that up I hope you can read that it says heat capacity so some of you might be familiar some of you might not be familiar um, just remember that you know, you know you can you can understand what it means uh, just by you know, paying attention to the words so capacity to retain heat so that's heat capacity essentially um, any material or any substance would have um, its own internal ability to retain heat so and that's what we call the heat capacity um, more formally it is the amount of heat necessary to raise temperature by one degree although you know one unit to be more precise because we can use either Kelvin or Celsius so if you raise the temperature of the material by one whether it's in um, Kelvin or Celsius that's the amount of heat um, so the amount of heat you need to raise the temperature by one would tell you the heat capacity of the material okay, so again I'm just using this uh, um, saying that it's in one degree so that it becomes easier for you to recognize um, uh, you know it is easier to to understand it in terms of Celsius in reality you don't have to so I'll show you in a bit why okay just remember that heat, heat capacity again is the amount of heat that you can put in a material before it changes its temperature by one. So these are in units. So if I just gonna write it that way, just try this up again. So heat capacity has units of joules per Kelvin or joules per degree Celsius. Now, why is this so? That's because we can write heat or Q 
which by the way is sometimes written with a small q in some books so you can write it as c delta t where c here is the so this is our heat capacity c okay, so this c is the heat capacity it has units of joules per kelvin or joules per degree celsius now the reason why it doesn't matter whether you use kelvin or celsius or even fahrenheit if you want to is because it's being multiplied with delta t now again this is a delta which means that uh, you're taking the difference between the final temperature from uh, the the difference of the final temperature and the initial temperature so again delta t is t final minus t initial okay so since we're taking the difference it doesn't matter whether it's kelvin or celsius because uh, if you remember um kelvin is um degree celsius plus 273 well well it's 273.15 but you know we, you can always round it off okay so regardless of whether you put kelvin or degree celsius it would this 273 would just come out because this is a difference so it would be like degree celsius plus 273 minus degree celsius minus 273 so the 273 just comes out all right and now there's a barking dog again um okay so we we also can write it in terms of heat capacity per gram in which case uh, we call it um, specific heat capacity okay. so we call it the specific heat capacity if it's heat capacity per gram so per unit mass so um, the way to say that would be um, the amount of heat necessary to raise the temperature by one for one gram of the material you can also write heat capacity per mole and this is the more um, common way of uh, com the more common um, use of the heat capacity in thermodynamic literature <coughs> so heat capacity per mole which we would call molar heat capacity So the only difference is that you know you have an additional gram or mole in the case of molar heat capacity in the denominator. So otherwise every, it works out the same way so that if you use heat capacity a specific heat capacity in this equation the resulting unit of Q would be joules per gram. In the case of heat capacity per mole if you use this equation you plug in here this the molar heat capacity then the resulting units of q would be joules per mole okay so you just cancel out the units of temperature all right um, so again remember that um, because heat capacity is a measure of the amount of heat a material can sustain or can retain um, if a material is able to conduct temperature better than um, if one material can conduct um, heat or can lose its temperature faster then it means that its heat capacity is smaller uh, a material that doesn't conduct uh, heat that much is therefore able to retain it better and has a higher heat capacity so in general no, I'm not gonna make a specific um, examples here and I'm just gonna take it from the properties of the different states so let's try this up in general um, the heat capacity has this type of order for the different states so uh, liquids normally have greater heat capacity than solids so why is this the case um, if you remember um, 
our uh, description of solids and liquids. So liquids have uh, particles that are farther apart compared to solids and the particles in a solid actually are placed in uh, specific points that are pretty much fixed so so that when the particles vibrate because of heat it would be easy for them to transfer heat to each other so, not in the case of liquids because you know because the particles are farther apart and are uh, more more mobile than those of the particles in the solids the conduction of heat is not as efficient so the, the result is that the heat capacity of liquids are in general higher than solids uh, in particular metals have a very low heat capacity because they can conduct uh, temperature very well uh, they can conduct heat rather very well so but um, also in general and this is the the part that it's uh, difficult to, to rationalize completely uh, that... sorry liquids also often have Uh, greater heat capacity than gases now why is this the case it's because in in some in in the gas gaseous state the particles are actually faster than the particles in the liquid state uh, only because the entropy is larger so we're gonna go into entropy in um, in the next set of lectures but for now just imagine you know, even though the, the particles of gases are farther apart if you can find them in a smaller space it would actually have a smaller heat capacity than a liquid in the same amount of space. So only because the gas particles are, are faster so that even though they are farther apart, it would be easier to transmit um, heat because they can collide uh, very easily because of their speed. Um, although of course, if, if you, this is only true for say for example for um, for water vapor and um, in some cases this isn't even true and we cannot make a complete order of liquids solids and then gases because we don't really know um, how gases compares uh, how gases compared to uh, solids in terms of heat capacities uh, in general of course again is that gases have higher heat capacity than solids again which is a gross uh, generalization because some solids are actually um, might actually be um, better at retaining heat than gases and in the case of solids where you have say an example like wood it doesn't actually conduct heat because it burns right away or anything that has cellulose for example so in, in that case the heat capacity is small only because you cannot measure it over a large temperature range because it burns okay so I hope that in the exam it doesn't come out to be you know, a really weird question about this but you know, the important part is this. So that's pretty sure. You know, most solids, uh, liquids are, have higher heat capacities than solids. Right, so but how do, we, how do we use the concept of heat capacity in problems involving the transfer of heat okay so far we know what heat capacity is all about how do we um, use it to understand um, transfers of heat so again I'm just gonna give you a, a rough idea of how heat is treated in uh, or handled in chem 16 whenever we're looking at q we're normally looking at um heat transfers so or we're, we're putting it in the context of heat transfers uh, while we're when we're looking at delta h or enthalpy uh, what we're looking at is uh, uh, what we attribute it to or associated with are uh, either physical changes or chemical changes Again, this is not um, um, the uh, correct way of, um, or the complete way of treating these properties in thermodynamic literature. We make it easier for Chem 16 because you know the whole body of thermodynamics is much larger than what Chem 16 can um, can, can can cover. Uh, 
Okay. So suppose that you have a metal ingot. Uh, so let's say that this is. Let me just take a look at an example here. Um, suppose this, this is a iron, a block of iron, and we want to place it inside. We want to place this inside <coughs> a calorimeter containing water inside. So we have water, and this is a calorimeter. Now, <coughs> this is of course just a fancy term to say that it's a container that pretty much ensures um, little to no transfer of heat. So whatever is inside the calorimeter whatever heat or amount of heat is inside the calorimeter doesn't leak out too much so this is like an isolated uh, um, thermally isolated container and we call the the walls of a calorimeter adiabatic so i i don't think i have um, discussed this um, in the past uh, few videos uh, if, So this term would mean that um, it does not allow the transfer of heat. So the assumption for a calorimeter is that the walls of the calorimeter are adiabatic. So it does not allow the transfer of heat. In the opposite sense, if it does transfer heat, then it would um, equalize the temperature. And in that case, it's called isothermal. Okay, so, but you're free to, to look at it through the books. Um, isothermal again means same temperature, adiabatic means same amount of heat. So in adiabatic in an adiabatic sense, you don't have a transfer of heat. In the isothermal sense, you have a transfer of heat so that the temperature becomes equal from you know, either side of the wall. All right, so we have a calorimeter, we have uh, water, We'll see this term again later on when we look at uh, chemical reactions. You have that in your experiment, I hope. Well, you know, you might not have that experiment anymore. <coughs> but um, just remember that the calorimeter makes sure that everything inside, any heat or energy term inside, is completely conserved. Well, almost completely conserved. Okay, right. so what we want to do is that, and you know, this is a hot ingot of iron. We want to put it in the calorimeter that has water in it at a lower temperature, say at room temperature. What's going to happen? So, we know from experience, of course, that if we put a hot object in a colder object, the hot object would lose a bit of heat so that, you know, that, that heat is transferred to the colder object up to the point where both of them would have the same temperature. Now, of course, if we follow the definitions or the descriptions that we had for specific heat capacity or molar heat capacity uh, remember that of course the change in temperature of or the amount of heat lost from the hot metal ingot in this case would be larger than the amount of uh, sorry yeah the amount of heat um, uh, released from the metal ingot would be the same amount of heat that should be absorbed by the calorimeter and the water. Now, why is this so? That is because of the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, so we need to have a conversation. Um, there's a conversation law inside the system. So we, we treat this entire thing, the ingot and calorimeter plus water as a system. Everything else is a surrounding. And because the walls of the calorimeter are adiabatic, uh, we essentially have no heat transfer to the surrounding. So everything inside the calorimeter must be conserved. This means, again, that whatever heat is lost from the hot metal ingot would just be absorbed by the water in the calorimeter. So if the walls of the calorimeter are perfectly adiabatic, then the amount of heat lost from the metal ingot would just be the same amount of heat absorbed by the calorimeter plus water. So that's our conservation principle. And we write it mathematically this way. Sorry, I'm using a different notation here. All right. <coughs> so that's Q of the ironing that water. <coughs> 
Okay, so these are all of the three terms that we expect to have uh, heat, whether it's a, a release of heat or absorption of heat. So, and then, again, because we're assuming that there's little heat transfer to the surroundings and everything must be conserved, our conservation law is completed this way. So, take note of the zero here. It's the same zero that we know. It's how we discussed the first law in the first place um, um, in a, one video back. So, what this tells us is that whatever heat is released from the hot metal ingot would just be absorbed by absorbed by water and the calorimeter. So, the decrease in heat from the hot metal ingot would mean the increase in heat of water and the calorimeter. So that's the conservation law that we have here, the energy conservation equation for this. Now that's the, the crucial part in this type of problem solving problem, uh, problem solving questions. Um, you have to understand uh, what sort of terms are involved. Um, um, in this case, if it's specific, uh, if it's explicitly stated that the calorimeter would um, absorb heat, then it should have a heat term in this conservation equation. If it's not, then the assumption is that all of the heat would simply be transferred to the water. Now, that's a very weird way of, um, you know, um, uh, uh, representing reality. But, uh, you know, questions like that do come up and it's, it's a demonstration of, or a, a test of how well you can understand um, the energy conservation principle that we're using in all these types of uh, questions. So again, uh, we have um, three materials here that, that are explicitly stated and so there must be three energy or heat, heat terms in our energy conservation equation. This is our energy conservation equation that's the most crucial part. If, um, you, it's easy to, 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 uh, to see from a question how many heat terms should be involved just by looking at the given data. So um, in this case, if, um, uh, if only two heat capacity uh, data are given for, say, for iron and water and nothing for the calorimeter, then just assume that um, the question only asks how much heat is transferred from the metal ingot to the water. If there's a heat capacity uh, value for the calorimeter as well, then assume that's, that's explicitly being asked for in the question as well, and that's what we see in this case. Okay. So again, in here, uh, we show precisely what we mean from uh, the energy conservation. So whatever heat is released from iron, because we assume that it's hotter than this whole thing, is simply uh, absorbed by water and calorimeter. So those, this negative sign ensures that the direction is reversed. So if this decreases, then because of the negative sign, these two things would increase. Okay? So And because um, if you go back to the equation, of the specific heat and molar heat capacities, um, remember that Q... Uh, back in those two equations, um, back in the equation of the heat capacity, uh, Q is directly proportional to delta T. So this, since this would have a decrease in heat, should have a delta T that's also negative. In this case, uh, on the other hand, it's the uh, water and calorimeter would both have a delta T that would be uh, positive so delta T negative for iron delta T positive for water and calorimeter because of the negative sign so um, that's how you know if you're doing things right <coughs> and also if um, remember um, if you remember um, uh, if you remember the equation for heat capacity you can also pretty much predict um, what sort of change in temperature all of these things would have. So let's just give a more concrete example of this uh, particular system. So I'm just going to use the same thing this time. 
I'm gonna put an actual data on this so that we can um, see what sort of problem solving question we can have. Okay, so I've written everything, um, uh, written a description of the system here. So much better to have this in writing. I would post the same um, example in the Facebook group page. Uh, suppose that the calorimeter contains, so this is 75 grams of water. Suppose that the calorimeter contains 75 grams of water and the temperature here is 16.95. Let me just erase that. So let's say that the temperature for this system is 16.95. 95 degrees so, uh, this particular part of the system that's calorimeter plus water calorimeter plus water would uh, have the temperature of 16.95 degrees and the sample of iron is 93.3 grams of iron so it's 93.3 grams of iron and this is at the temperature 65.58 degrees okay so these are the data so far once once the iron is put into this calorimeter and thermal equilibrium is achieved so this means that you have to wait a while because all of the energy would be transferred in such a way that the temperature would finally stay at a constant value um, then the final temperature becomes 19.68 degrees. Okay. Okay, so that's that's um, the final temperature once you put the iron into the calorimeter and wait for thermal equilibrium. All right, and then um, some of the data for the heat capacities are for for water that's 4.184 joules per gram I'm sorry joules per gram degrees Celsius Let me write that better joules per gram degrees Celsius so it's the degree Celsius is in the denominator and while the iron sample the iron ingot would have 0 0.444 joules per gram degree Celsius okay and that's all the data that we need now take a note here that since iron has a smaller heat capacity or in this case specific heat capacity than water you will see that delta t the magnitude of delta t for iron is larger than the magnitude of delta t for the water and the calorimeter so more heat comes out of a material that has a smaller heat capacity all right so just take a note of those um, values you can pause the video if you want Okay, so what we're trying to find in this case, and what we want to have, uh, what uh, the problem actually tries to ask for, what the uh, specific, uh, what what's the heat capacity of the, what the calorimeter's heat capacity is. Okay, so, yung tinatanong niya, ito yung data, ano daw yung heat capacity ng calorimeter? Okay. So, yun ang hanapin natin. Mahirap pala pag maraming sinusulat. So I hope this is getting, uh, you know, this is useful to you so far. Because if it's not, it's giving me a really hard time to prepare. Um, okay, so we have, I hope that you have copied the data. Uh, you, you know, you can always pause the video, go back to it 
go back to the specific part. Um, again, I'm just going to write the uh, energy conservation equation. We have Q ingot plus Q water plus Q calorie meter is equal to zero. Now, since we're trying to find the heat capacity, of, the heat capacity of the calorimeter, I'm just gonna put, I'm just gonna isolate Q cal over here. And put the terms for water and iron on the other side. So we have Q, F, E, Q, water. Negative sign because of this conservation. Let me just check if it's still working. All right. Okay, so we now have uh, our backbone for solving the problem. We just put in the values that we have used earlier. We have uh, taken a look at earlier. All right. So Chukal would have um, C calorimeter delta T. Yeah, I'm just going to put a subscript of E calorimeter to indicate that we're looking at the total change of temperature for the calorimeter. Um, this would only this would be the same as the change in temperature for water because they started out with the same temperature. And then I'm going to write 75 which is the the grams of water inside the calorimeter if you remember. I'm gonna skip the units here because it's it's gonna clutter the entire thing. So this, the space is not too much for everything for me to write on. Now 75 times the, if you don't remember, this is the heat capacity of water. So let me just rewrite that and follow this order instead. Okay, para para malino sa inyo. We're just expanding this with the data. So. I'm just going to take a look at Q4 iron first. So that's 93.3 grams, if you remember in the given. Multiplied by the heat capacity of iron uh, for the given, it's 0.444. Again, this is in units of grams. This is in units of uh, joules per gram. So the gram unit cancels out. Let me repeat that. This is joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, delta T in this case for iron would be, um, again, it's delta T, it's, it's final minus initial. So the final temperature, if you remember, is 19.68. And the iron started out at 65.58. So that's delta T for, for iron. And you know right away that it's going to be negative because, obviously, because it's hotter, it would lose heat. And so therefore its temperature would decrease next up is water and we remember that it's 75 grams it has a heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree celsius and the change in temperature is um, the final temperature 19.68 minus the initial temperature which is 16.95 all right so just remember this part, This uh, the delta T for water again would be the same delta T for the calorimeter. I just didn't write it out explicitly. We know it to be true because they both started out at 16.95. So this is the entire uh, expansion of this part. Again, unit of gram, joules per gram degree Celsius, degree Celsius. So degree Celsius cancels out, gram cancels out, what's left is joules per degree Celsius, uh, sorry, so what comes out is joules. So it's the same thing here. So this is delta, uh, this is degree Celsius, this is joules per gram degree Celsius, and this is grams. So grams and degree Celsius cancels out, so this entire thing would also have a unit of joules, which is the unit of C cal times delta T calorimeter. All right, and if we <coughs> plug in the values, so this would come down in the denominator if I put it on the right-hand side of the equation. I evaluate all of this. 
divide. So that's what's going to happen. Ulitin ko lang. Eh. So if I evaluate all of this, pag kinuha ko yung value nito, i-divide ko nito, which is also 19.68 minus 16.95. And what I should get is a value of 8. Again, I evaluate this, all of this, and I would be left with the unit of joules. I put this in the right-hand side of the equation to isolate C cal. Delta T cal, again, is in uh, the degree Celsius. So if I put it at the right-hand side, it becomes part of the denominator. So it's like this whole thing divided by delta T calorimeter would give me units of joules per degree Celsius. And evaluated numerically gives it 382.7. Please confirm that with your own computation. See if this is correct. If it's not, you can comment it and uh, uh, comment in the video. So that's essentially it. Uh, in some cases, again, like um, I um, uh, indicated a while ago, sometimes in a question, there's, there's no QCAL and you simply have to find the say the final temperature so it's just managing this energy conservation equation plugging in what you have and then isolating what you don't have okay so kanil lang naman simply lang siya mostly algebraic you just have to remember to uh, write the minus sign this this is something that i've seen in some of the uh, past uh, classes in chem 16 uh, they get the data right, so tama yung pagkakasulat ng mga students ng data, lahat yan. So, nakuha ng tama ito, tapos nakalimunan lang minus sign. So, mali, mali yun. Um, so, and also, minsan napapagbaliktad itong sa delta T. Remember that it's final minus initial. So, dun lang naman nagkaka-problema. Pero again, it's a simple algebraic uh, problem where you have one unknown and you just want to isolate that in the equation. Okay. But again, the way you write this is from how the question is phrased. And I'll give you another example of it. I'll post the, this together with that example in the Facebook group page. Um, uh, I will keep doing that for our, all other examples. So I'll give one example in each of the videos, each subtopics that I discuss in the videos. And if you want to have a more dedicated video for problem solving you will have to request me for that so i won't do it explicitly because this is very difficult to to prepare so i'll i'll, I'll try to to get one problem solving um video out only if i feel that you this is just not enough for you so you have to tell me if i need to prepare more okay because otherwise i'm just posting those um uh I'll be posting the examples on the Facebook group page. If you are not a member yet, um, ask people, uh, ask your classmates. If there are people who don't know that that Facebook group exists, tell them. If they don't know that this YouTube video is posted, uh, and that the, the, the account even exists, tell them about it. Uh, don't share the video unless you know it's for educational purposes. Don't use it for entertainment, like you know, create a meme out of this. And um, yeah, you just be responsible as a student for this, you know, for all of the things that you would see in this video. Again, if you have any questions or comments, like you don't understand one part, for example, um, just comment on the uh, video. And if it's easy enough for me to answer, I'll just reply to you. If it's not, then I'll you know I'll, I'll put it in a more dedicated video. All right. So that's as far as. Um, a concrete example of heat exchange and how it's used in problem solving and for the next part I'm just going to show you what happened in your um, in your what should have happened in your calorimetry experiment so although this should have should also be discussed by your instructors I'm just going to repeat or echo some parts so that uh, in case your instructor was unable to give it to you uh, or was unable to give a more detailed lecture on this. I'm just gonna give a few symbolic um, 
I'm gonna do this symbolically. Um, I'm just gonna write the, the sort of the gist of the calorimetry experiment. So what you have in the calorimetry experiment is um, you have a neutralization reaction that has um, where you have um, an acid as a base of course and one of those is going to be a limiting reactant and this acid base reaction is in reference to you know how much heat an acid base reaction is, is going to produce so you have a reference delta H of reaction and this particular reaction is neutralization so you have what's given in your experiment um, you have delta H of reaction for the calorimetry experiment and now you try to, to you try to find the amount of heat liberated by um, the reaction of an acid in the base so let me just just do this again <laughs> all right so you have an acid in the base and you want to find how much heat is liberated from it um, in, a, in a way that you know you, you are going to compute for the delta H of the reaction now of course you cannot do that without any reference value for neutralization reaction so the um, the first step in the calorimetry experiment um, and that's why the re that's the reason why you need to have this reference uh, delta H of reaction is you're going to try to find the heat capacity of the calorimeter so remember of course that in this particular example your calorimeter would be would look like a coffee cup so that it's gonna be a coffee cup coffee cup calorimeter with a thermometer <laughs> stuff into it okay, so the reaction is going to happen inside you're going to measure the temperature with this thermometer you know, punctured into the um, cover and here the, the change in temperature would give you an indication of the heat capacity of this entire thing so what you know right away is the heat capacity of water because this is just 4.1 and 4 joules per gram degree celsius but in this case, of course, you would write the energy conservation equation as Q reaction. Because this is where the heat, all of the heat is going to come from. And that heat would be absorbed by water and calorimeter. And again, it's styrofoam, so the assumption is that little heat would leak out over time so that by the time you measure the temperature, from thermal equilibrium it would be stable long enough for you to know you know what the final temperature would be right after the reaction completes so again in that case because we assume that this thing is completely adiabatic um the total would be zero and these are all the heat terms involved now in order for you to find the heat capacity of the calorimeter this term here is the easiest again because from just looking at the temperatures you would know delta t so you know delta t you know how much water is inside because you prepared the solution you also know the heat capacity of water so this term is almost perfectly computed uh, this term would have uh, what you can measure uh, regarding this term would be delta t as well that that's the easiest part you just take a look at the before and after temperatures the same way that you do for you know, these two things these two heat terms would have the same delta t essentially because that's it's it's just going to uh, get the change in temperature inside this calorimeter this part on the other hand unlike our example earlier would not come from a material that has a known heat capacity instead this is related to delta H of the reaction. And if you remember the, um, what I said in the video um, in part one, I think, um, this is simply 
so I wrote it here explicitly as limiting reactant because you know um, what I said in the past video about heat is that it's pretty much since it's extensive it pretty much obeys the same rules as stoichiometry uh, for you know moles so if uh, the amount of prod if the amount of product like in this case if it's an acid in the base then it's a salt plus water if the amount of product is limited by the limiting reactant so is the amount of heat that is liberated I say if the heat is liberated it's going to come out in the product side right like the chemical re reaction um, if uh, so if the amount again the amount of product is limited the amount of heat is also limited so that's why we have it here as a modes of um, limiting reactant and what i wrote in the video earlier is that you know q over n is delta h so here i'm just gonna make it specific to to say that delta h of reaction is the heat of the reaction divided by the modes of limiting reactant in that reaction okay so that's why you, when you're trying to find out the heat capacity of the calorimeter, you're using a reference uh, delta H first. Because, you know, if you know the limit number most of limiting reactant, and you multiply it with the reference delta H, you would know Q reaction. And so everything in this equation would be nearly complete except for the heat capacity of the calorimeter. So let me just repeat that in case you didn't get it the first time. This is our energy uh, conservation equation because we assume that the styrofoam is you know, um, adiabatic and that it would limit the leak of temperature of the leak of heat outside such that you can measure the final temperature with a reasonably decent amount of time. Okay, so in these three terms, only two terms would be dependent on delta T and that's QH2O and Q calorimeter okay, that's what the thermometer is for so but in the case of um, um, Q of water you can complete uh, you can compute this right away because you know the amount of water that you use to prepare the solution or the reaction you also know the heat capacity of water and from the thermometer you would also know Delta T in Q cal Q calorimeter you only know delta t so you don't know the heat capacity of the calorimeter yet q reaction on the other hand is not dependent on delta t because in this case we're taking a look at q as the amount of heat related to a chemical reaction so no del delta t involved unlike our previous example so if you're taking a look at heat that is associated with the chemical reaction there's no mention of delta t so but this q reaction because it's related, uh, Q reaction is related to, uh, because it's for a reaction, there is an enthalpy term related to it too. So, again, these two are essentially the same. There's no real difference between Q and delta H, in fact. We make a distinction where in Chem 16 to, you know, to sort of simplify or categorize things better. So, these are the same except for the number of moles. So we report delta H of the reaction as joules per mole, whereas we report in this case all of the heat terms in joules, just like in our earlier example. So this is true. You use this equation when you're trying to find the heat capacity of the calorimeter. The next time you use this equation, having known the heat capacity of the calorimeter, you would now be able to find the heat that comes out of a reaction for an acid-base reaction that is not um, um, that is not associated with reference delta H. So, yung first na delta H reaction nyo, ang gagamitin yung acid and base ay yun yung reference na reaction. Yun yung para sa delta H na reaction na reference. Okay? So, ginamit nyo, kunyari, hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. Alam yung delta H na reaction inanap nyo yung heat capacity ng calorimeter the first time around. The second time around, hindi nyo na alam yung delta H ng reaction ng acid and base nyo. So, hindi nyo na kayo makagamit ng reference ng delta H reaction. Instead, you would compute Q reaction based on the energy balance equation. So, since alam nyo na yung heat capacity in the second iteration experiment, 
second phase ng experiment alam mo na heat capacity ng calorimeter kaya mo nang measure yung delta T uli kaya mo palaging gawin yun then these two terms can be computed right away and you're just left with finding Q reaction so that's for the second phase unknown na yung acid and base nyo unknown na yung delta H ng reaction niya but then again you can compute <coughs> the delta H of reaction for this um, new acid and base pair using against this using again this relation okay so first step um, gagamit ng reference delta H reaction reference na acid and base uh, uh, makocompute yung Q reaction para dun alam yung QH2O palagi kasi alam may amount ng water palagi hindi mo alam yung sikal yun yung hinanap mo the first in the first step <clears throat> in the second step hindi na reference yung acid and base mo so hindi mo na alam to pero since alam mo na yung heat capacity ng calorimeter kaya mo na rin i-compute tong dalawa so, mula dito sa dalawang to malalaman mo yung pure reaction for the new and unknown acid and base reaction at makocompute mo yung delta H of reaction nun gamit uli itong equation na to but in either step, this would hold. And again, I cannot emphasize this even, <clears throat> even more. This is what you need to get correctly all the time. If you fail to do this part, if you fail to get this correctly, manila lahat yung magagamit mo sa kahit na anong problem solving na related sa kanya. Okay, so dito kayo muna magpay attention. Kung nasusulat nyo ng tama lahat ng kailangan. And dito, sa experiment, kakailangan nyo ito because explicitly pinahanap. In questions in the exam, pwedeng hindi explicit, ano na siya, implied na hindi mo na siya kailangan na data. Makikita nyo yun in the examples. Um, I'm gonna try to give you a long quiz pa rin. I hope that you would try to answer it uh, individually, personally. Okay. So, how many means do we have so far? I have no idea. Okay. So, um, tuliban natin, mamamaya naman. Sige. So, again, if you have any questions on this, just write in the comments. Um, I hope na na-discuss din ito ng um, instructor nyo. Pagka hindi, and you want me to repeat with an actual um, example, with all data and all, or, you know, with data and all of the necessary things, um, just tell me. And I would make a dedicated video for that. Okay, so let's stop for now before we continue with uh, Delta H naman. Alright.